Lady Arbella watches all these sights, and feels that this new world is fit only for rough and hardy people. None should be here but those who can struggle with wild beasts and wild men, and can toil in the heat or cold, and can keep their hearts firm against all difficulties and dangers. But she is not one of these. Her gentle and timid spirit sinks within her, and turning away from the window she sits down in the great chair, and wonders thereabouts in the wilderness her friends will dig her grave. Mr. Johnson had gone, with Governor Winthrop and most of the other passengers, to Boston, where he intended to build a house for Lady Arbella and himself. Boston was then covered with wild woods, and had fewer inhabitants even than Salem. During her husband's absence, poor Lady Arbella felt herself growing ill, and was hardly able to stir from the great chair. Whenever John Endicott noticed her despondency, he doubtless addressed her with words of comfort. Cheer up, my good lady, he would say. In a little time, you will love this rude life of the wilderness as I do. But Endicott's heart was as bold and resolute as iron, and he could not understand why a woman's heart should not be of iron too. Still, however, he spoke kindly to the lady, and then hastened forth to till his corn field and set out fruit trees, or to bargain with the Indians for furs, or perchance to oversee the building of a fort. Also being a magistrate, he had often to punish some idler or evildoer, by ordering him to be set in the stocks or scourged at the whipping post. Often, too, as was the custom of the times, he and Mr. Higginson, the minister of Salem, held long religious talks together. Thus John Endicott was a man of multifarious business, and had no time to look back regretfully to his native land. He felt himself fit for the new world, and for the work that he had to do, and set himself resolutely to accomplish it. What a contrast, my dear children, between this bold, rough, active man, and the gentle Lady Arbella, who was fading away, like a pale English flower, in the shadow of the forest. And now the great chair was often empty, because Lady Arbella grew too weak to arise from bed. Meantime, her husband had pitched upon a spot for their new home. He returned from Boston to Salem, traveling through the woods on foot, and leaning on his pilgrim's staff. His heart yearned within him, for he was eager to tell his wife of the new home which he had chosen. But when he beheld her pale and hollow cheek, and found how her strength was wasted, he must have known that her appointed home was in a better land. Happy for him then, happy both for him and her, if they remembered that there was a path to heaven, as well from this heathen wilderness as from the Christian land whence they had come. And so, in one short month from her arrival, the gentle Lady Arbella faded away and died. They dug a grave for her in the new soil, where the roots of the pine trees impeded their spades, and when her bones had rested there nearly two hundred years, and a city had sprung up around them, a church of stone was built upon the spot. Charlie, almost at the commencement of the foregoing narrative, had galloped away with a prodigious clatter, upon grandfather's stick, and was not yet returned. So large a boy should have been ashamed to ride upon a stick. But Lawrence and Clara had listened attentively, and were affected by this true story of the gentle lady, who had come so far to die so soon. Grandfather had supposed that little Alice was asleep, but, towards the close of the story, happening to look down upon her, he saw that her blue eyes were wide open, and fixed earnestly upon his face. The tears had gathered in them, like dew upon a delicate flower, but when Grandfather ceased to speak, the sunshine of her smile broke forth again. Oh, the lady must have been so glad to get to heaven, exclaimed little Alice. Grandfather, what became of Mr. Johnson? asked Clara. His heart appears to have been quite broken, answered Grandfather, for he died at Boston within a month after the death of his wife. He was buried in the very same tract of ground, where he had intended to build a dwelling for Lady Arbella and himself. Where their house would have stood there was his grave. I never heard anything so melancholy, said Clara. The people loved and respected Mr. Johnson so much, continued Grandfather, that it was the last request of many of them, when they died, that they might be buried as near as possible to this good man's grave and so the field became the first burial ground in Boston. When you pass through Tremont Street, along by King's Chapel, you see a burial ground, containing many old gravestones and monuments. That was Mr. Johnson's field, how sad is the thought, observed Clara, that one of the first things which the settlers had to do, when they came to the New World, was to set apart a burial ground, perhaps, said Lawrence, if they had found no need of burial grounds here, they would have been glad, after a few years, to go back to England, grandfather looked at Lawrence, to discover whether he knew how profound and true a thing he had said. Chapter 3. Not long after grandfather had told the story of his great chair, there chanced to be a rainy day. 
Our friend Charlie, after disturbing the household with beat of drum and riotous shouts, races up and down the staircase, overturning of chairs, and much other uproar, began to feel the quiet and confinement within doors intolerable. But as the rain came down in a flood, the little fellow was hopelessly a prisoner, and now stood with sullen aspect at a window, wondering whether the sun itself were not extinguished by so much moisture in the sky. Charlie had already exhausted the less eager activity of the other children, and they had betaken themselves to occupations that did not admit of his companionship. Lawrence sat in a recess near the bookcase, reading, not for the first time, The Midsummer Night's Dream. Clara was making a rosary of beads for a little figure of a sister of charity, who was to attend the Bunker Hill Fair, and lent her aid in erecting the monument. Little Alice sat on Grandfather's footstool, with a picture book in her hand, and, for every picture, the child was telling Grandfather a story. She did not read from the book, for Little Alice had not much skill in reading, but told the story out of her own heart and mind. Charlie was too big a boy, of course, to care anything about Little Alice's stories, although Grandfather appeared to listen with a good deal of interest. Often, in a young child's ideas and fancies, there is something which it requires the thought of a lifetime to comprehend. But Charlie was of opinion, that if a story must be told, it had better be told by Grandfather, than Little Alice. Grandfather, I want to hear more about your chair, said he. Now Grandfather remembered that Charlie had galloped away upon a stick, in the midst of the narrative of poor Lady Arbella, and I know not whether he would have thought it worth while to tell another story, merely to gratify such an inattentive auditor as Charlie. But Lawrence laid down his book and seconded the request. Clara drew her chair nearer to Grandfather, and little Alice immediately closed her picture book, and looked up into his face. Grandfather had not the heart to disappoint them. He mentioned several persons who had a share in the settlement of our country, and who would be well worthy of remembrance, if we could find room to tell about them all. Among the rest, Grandfather spoke of the famous Hugh Peters, a minister of the Gospel, who did much good to the inhabitants of Salem. Mr. Peters afterwards went back to England, and was chaplain to Oliver Cromwell, but Grandfather did not tell the children what became of this upright and zealous man, at last. In fact, his auditors were growing impatient to hear more about the history of the chair. After the death of Mr. Johnson, said he, Grandfather's chair came into the possession of Roger Williams. He was a clergyman, who arrived at Salem, and settled there in 1631. Doubtless the good man has spent many a studious hour in this old chair, either penning a sermon, or reading some abstruse book of theology, till midnight came upon him unawares. At that period, as there were few lamps or candles to be had, people used to read. Or work by the light of pitch-pine torches. These supplied the place of the midnight oil, to the learned men of New England. Grandfather went on to talk about Roger Williams, and told the children several particulars, which we have not room to repeat. One incident, however, which was connected with his life, must be related, because it will give the reader an idea of the opinions and feelings of the first settlers of New England. It was as follows. The Red Cross. While Roger Williams sat in Grandfather's chair, at his humble residence in Salem, John Endicott would often come to visit him. As the clergy had great influence in temporal concerns, the minister and magistrate would talk over the occurrences of the day, and consult how the people might be governed according to scriptural laws. 